good evening and welcome to Fashion Declares. My name is Safia Mini and I'm going to be your host for this evening, Fashion Communications in the Climate, Ecological and Social Emergency. Well, I don't know why I'm smiling really, because it, it, it you know, it's not the kind of thing that you do smile about, but I am delighted to be here with you this evening uh, and we, we have a fantastic audience too. So um, really, really pleased um, that we can talk about this uh, huge topic um, and as I say, we are joined by some really, really fabulous speakers. So this evening, you're going to hear from uh, myself. I'm going to give you a bit of a context of Fashion Declares and the Climate, Ecological and Social Emergency. Then we're going to hear from Devorah, who's a brilliant photographer. We're going to hear from Karen Franklin, who's been a great friend. We've traveled in Bangladesh together. Um, she's a commentator on sustainable fashion and diversity and inclusion. And then we have a video from Fanny, who is the co-founder of Vestiaire Collective. And then we'll be hearing from Lucy Shea from Frutera, really um, fantastic agency that I've admired for a long time. And then we'll have a Q&A. So this animation in front of you shows how uh, the earth has heated um, over the last 200 years. So since industrialization, uh, this is if, uh, 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 an animated showing of just how hot the earth has become. And if we move to the next slide, we can see that despite all of the cops, um, we are still heading for three degrees or more. Um, that if we look at the uh, extreme weather patterns that we're experiencing um, in the majority world um, and, and currently in, in Europe, the US and Australia, that these frequent um, extreme weather patterns are impacting through uninhabitable land creation and loss of, of biodiversity and destabilizing food and water scarcity are impacting uh, increasingly more people's lives. And if, if you look at the human uh, climate niche report, it says that it's in 2070 that more than three billion people will be on the move um, as, as, as their livelihoods, as their, the water and, the, and the, the food that has sustained them um, is no longer available to them. So we are looking at a catastrophic change that is, that is nearly unimaginable despite the, the weather and the signals that are so clear to us today. So many of you have seen this chart, I'm sure, um, in the UK, we we create, a, on average, an individual will create about 13 tonnes of CO2 per year. Australia is there at the top at 29 tonnes of CO2. And you can see um, China and Brazil um, down there at the bottom per capita at, at seven and, and four tonnes of CO2. India is, is one tonne of CO2. So what we're needing to address and fashion communications and creating this new narrative is about how we change mindsets and behaviors and culture actually to a lifestyle that is about living uh, the 1.5 degree lifestyle. Although many would say that we're, we would be lucky if we managed to, to limit us to our, our temperature to, to about two degrees above industrialized levels. These two books um, I highly recommend um, How Bad Are Bananas, absolutely brilliant book. This will help you to become carbon literate. And if you're thinking about communications, it's very difficult to, to think about how you might communicate uh, a more sustainable, um, low carbon living if, if you haven't really understood it at a personal level. So really, really highly recommend um, these books if you've not read them. So um, the, the charter to the fashion industry was to align its communication efforts to entice consumers to lead lives uh, that limit the global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. And the guidance of the industry is to commit to accurate reporting and transparent communication efforts and avoid exaggeration or omission to appear more environmentally or socially friendly and focus on inclusive marketing and storytelling that encourages a more equitable industry. So the consultation noted that, that some of the current means of communicating will need to be eradicated to deliver 
to deliver on the climate agenda. And this includes messages tied to overconsumption or shopping as a reward, breaking those markdown cycles and not commodifying issues like the, the climate crisis. Participants recognised that changing the narrative would be a challenging task since fashion communications are often about are often driven by the profit motive. That it would require creativity and long term thinking to decouple value from volume growth. Experts agreed that the fashion sector has enormous potential to lay the foundations for a more sustainable and equitable future through its actions and its storytelling. And doing so will take bold vision, but could also set a precedent for um, move, um, a wider climate movement. So the consultation found aligning communications to the Paris Agreement goal means promoting lifestyles and values that help, help limit the global temperature rise. And the recommendations were committing to accurate reporting and transparent communication efforts, uh, avoiding these um, um, exaggerated um, claims or omitting or, or appearing environmentally and socially friendly without doing anything, championing changes and demonstrating solutions to help individuals uh, live a more sustainable lifestyle and spotlighting new role models and notions of aspirational success, celebrating the ecological, the cultural and the social values of the industry and focusing on inclusive marketing and storytelling and mobilising the public to advocate for broader change. So we have a number of really expert speakers, um, people whose, whose work I admire enormously, um, who can help to share their ideas and from, from their perspectives, how they can see some of these, these parts can be pulled into existence because we are, we, are, we are really building a foundational model for this change now. So I'd like to invite Devora uh, to, to introduce herself um, and also tell us a little bit about what brought you to um, the Fashion Declares movement. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Safia. Um, I'm Devora. I'm uh, an award-winning photographer and um, Fashion Declares, uh, became very important to me um, after the journey that I've been on recently, which I will um, carry on and tell you now. So if Millie, if you could put my first slide up, please, that would be fantastic. So, um, so far, uh, as far as our webinars are concerned, we, we've been talking about the takeaways from COP26 and the fast fashion communications. and how we address this, the, the hows and the whys. And um, we carry on this evening, I, I feel, with the whys. Um, so about me, um, I, democratizing fashion um, was a term that came up when I first started my blog. Um, and I was shooting street style. I was happy with this because uh, that, um, um, that included me. I, you know, I came from a, uh, a working class background and um, I thought that it was right that all voices should be heard. Um, this wasn't, um, but this wasn't how the upper echelons thought, of course. Um, but having a blog suddenly meant that I had a platform to show my work. It gave me and the work purpose. Um, it turns out I was also quite good at it, actually. <laughs> um, and for the next decade, I traveled the world doing something that I loved um, and uh, working for well-known magazines. Um, it was a uh, high energy work. And um, for four months of the year, I got to create new images every single day, mostly on the street, um, but some backstage too. At the, at the start, um, the brief um, was uh, not to shoot uh, people wearing vintage as I was known uh, to do that um, and um, it was something that I really liked doing. I always thought the people who could dress well in vintage were amazing um, but the, the, that love did mean that I, I did get uh, to work with Fanny from Vestiaire who you will hear from later and with v William Vintage. <clears throat> uh, with time the, the brief uh, came to 
include shooting editors as well. And also with further time, um, um, it became not democratic anymore because it was very obvious that all the influencers uh, were from privileged backgrounds. Um, and uh, the photographers were beginning to feel that uh, they were being used as we were not being paid anywhere near the same amount as they were, uh, yet we were uh, their vehicle to raise their profile. Um, but um, the great thing was that because people came from all corners of the globe uh, uh, for the fashion weeks, there was a diversity of people which uh, has always been a, an important factor for me in my work. Um, and also, you know, in amongst all of that, um, you know, I got to photograph famous people and um, um, uh, shoot for shoot for Vogue. And also this is some of the backstage uh, work that I got to do. Um, again, not, not very inclusive back there uh, at the time. Um, so gradually I began to realize that my work was fueling fast fashion, which didn't sit with me at all well, especially as um, I had been known for photographing people who were in vintage. Um, I remember seeing the first Extension Rebellion protest on the way to one of the shows and thinking actually, I think I should be over there. Um, also during this time, I realized that the people advocating for change were mainly women. And I knew it was time for me to ch uh, change uh, the way I told the story of fashion and tell it in a very different way. Um, and uh, one of the first, uh, after Extinction Rebellion, one of the first walks I went on was for uh, Culture Declares. Uh, so um, I started, um, I knew I wanted to use my photography to raise the voices of uh, the women who were telling this story. And right now I'm in the middle of a project, which wasn't actually a project when I started it. <laughs> I thought I was telling uh, individual stories of uh, women who advocate for ethical, sustainable, environmental change with some focus on fashion. As the body of work grew, I knew it was, it, I knew it was a project. I knew I wanted to photograph 80 women as a represent, representation of the fact that 80% uh, of garment workers are women. I photograph and interview everyone and the, and the aim is to have an exhibition. They say if, the, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And I hope the exhibition will help awaken more people to what we can achieve and that positive change is possible. And these are some of the amazing women uh, that I have uh, photographed and interviewed so far and some of the faces you will recognize from the, the slides. Um, and as I say, I, I'm, I'm, I've got, a, I've, I'm about halfway through uh, the project at the moment, and it's taking longer than I, <laughs> I had anticipated, um, which is great. I've learned a lot along the way. Um, so. The future, um, what, what is the future of, of, of communications and how I see it? Well, I still feel that there's a, a way to go yet. Uh, recently, Fashion Declares was invited to um, Northern Fashion Week and it was good to be backstage again, because it's been quite a while for me as I stopped doing all of this in 2019 um, and then COVID got in the way. <laughs> <laughs> for, as we know, stopped everything. Um, and it was great to see that there was more diversity and inclusion in the casting for the shows. However, standing back, backstage, I also realized as an older person, I wasn't represented and neither were people with bigger bodies. I also left wondering about the origins. I uh, was also left wondering about the origins of the clothing. I didn't feel that that was being talked about uh, uh, still. And for me, that's vital as is raising the voices of women. As a female photographer, oh, sorry, if we could uh, change the slide, please, Millie, so you can see some of the work that uh, some of the pictures I took uh, during uh, Northern Fashion Week. And we had a lovely diversity of, uh, of people, uh, as you can see. So I'm going to finish on this slide. So as a female photographer, uh, the numbers are stark. 80% of photography students are female, yet it is the 20% of the male students who will get 80% of the work when they leave. As a street style photographer, after seeing all the male photographers being interviewed and filmed, I did a quick uh, head count uh, and realized there were more women than men doing the same thing, but we were invisible. Uh, we weren't being filmed, we weren't being 
asked our opinion in any shape or form and the men were all being um, uh, highlighted and you probably know if you know uh, um, if you know street style photography at, at all, you probably know a lot of male street style photographers and very few, or any women at all. Um, so this, the, 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 the image on the, the left is the resulting image I posted into Instagram to talk about this. Instantly, I lost a hundred followers because I said it. Uh, as you can see, most of the women are white, but happily not all of them. Um, the only black and brown photographers were all male. Across the board, this must change. On the right of the, the slide um, of the screen, there are um, three black and brown photog female photographers who work I really like. And uh, black women photographers on Instagram is a great source uh, for more wonderful work so that there are, is more inclusion uh, and everybody is uh, represented. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. And, um, you know, we we applaud your tenacity in building this new narrative and, and, and leading projects uh, as a creative, but, but as a producer of, of a really huge um, body of work. Um, and I and I hope your your photographs get the the kind of exhibition and um, support that they that they deserve, but um, that some of these issues, I think Karen will also be be building on. Um, Karen, we've we've travelled in in Bangladesh together. We've looked at what sustainable and and fair supply chains can look like. We've also um, looked at how you know predominantly it is women that produce fashion. Of those seventy million people, the majority are women. Um, the fashion industry is, is notorious for the exploitation of, of uh, workers and women um, as it is of, of natural resources. Um, can, I, can I ask you please to introduce your, your work? Um, I, you know, it, it covers a huge span. Um, I, would, I would be really grateful to learn more about your, your recent work and your recent book. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Safia. Hello, everyone. Lovely to be here. Really enjoyed your presentation, Devorah. Um, so I'm sort of jumping off that, really, just to say that my work has pretty much been in the area of body diversity, representation, inclusion. And that's simply because I came from a street style magazine in the 80s, ID magazine, and I was fashion editor and co-editor there for some time before I moved into fashion broadcast on the UK's BBC for 12 years. And we also enacted uh, a very kind of wide um, um, uh, sort of collection of, of people, uh, simply because the, the sort of broadcasting ethics were spoken about at the time in a way that magazines haven't discussed ethics of representation. And so throughout my work um, to include the award-winning All Walks Beyond the Catwalk, which I, uh, I and a group of women began in 2009 to really highlight the fashion industry industry's dependence on unachievable body ideals and the way in which that communicates to so many users of fashion about their entitlement to feel good about themselves, about their um, uh, the opportunity for them to feel that they belong and that uh, they can uh, feel that fashion sees them and includes them. And of course, they met, they're not there in the optics, in the way that they're represented. Then they, until recently, things are slowly changing, but they haven't been there in the sizing. Um, and they haven't been there in the conversations uh, in terms of the marketing. Uh, women haven't led those conversations, which has often led to us having hypersexualization as a representation of women, objectification of women. And this is communications where women are showcasing uh, clothes on their bodies. They're showcasing women's wear and they're speaking to women. And yet there is a great deal of male gaze within those narratives, most of it unconscious, because as we're all learning, the privilege that life uh, delivers us when we think about our own positionality, our own privileges because of our identity and because of the way we've been perhaps protected from some of the 
difficulties that that people whose identities intersect in a variety of ways means that there are impediments to their life. And one of the things, uh, ways in which we can define privilege, because so, some do still struggle uh, with that, is the absence of impediments. Um, so, uh, you know, as a cisgender, uh, able-bodied, white, straight, middle-class woman, I acknowledge the absence of very many impediments. And so that does inform my work. And certainly in, in later years, and still seeing the barriers that I was coming up against, specifically around emotional sustainability. Because if people are emotionally undermined, then they don't have the self-regard needed, the confidence needed to, uh, to protest or to demand better. And so that's what took me to study psychology, because I wanted to look at uh, why the human barriers were there. And I wanted to look at our own drives and motivations. So I have uh, created a little presentation which actually looks at sustainable fashion from that point of view. So it might not be the kind of average thing that we talk about, but I thought it was worth showing, uh, putting it into the mix, because I'm thinking about business declares and the, uh, um, obviously the alignment that many creatives and, and small businesses wish to have with all of the sustainable ideals, but we have still quite a lot to understand in the way that we speak to consumers. Next slide, please, Millie. So I wanted to uh, look at some quite popularist questions, but bring a little bit of psychology to it. For my source, I used uh, Alex Asun and uh, his blog, Panaprium, to, to get some of the uh, stats and the questions. And so in red are the key things for us to focus on the fact that uh, in the in the US, 88% of consumers just state it as a preference that they prefer fast fashion and in Europe is is not that far behind. So we're talking about wanting to help consumers understand that curbing their materialistic drives would be a good thing. But we need to acknowledge, uh, we've talked about the women as garment workers, 80% of the low paid garment workers are women, uh, those who aren't in posi positions of leadership, able to influence their own life choices. Uh, we also need to look at the, uh, the, the proportion of consumers. We know that uh, young women are a very high uh, group of um, are targeted by fast fashion retailers. And, and as we see here, often aged between 18 and 24, they are, they, they are on a position financially where they do have uh, low incomes. And so they are the ones we could say who are being effectively engaged thus far by uh, uh, fashion communication and possibly not effectively engaged by sustainable fashion communication and how do we um, how do we engage with them well let's just recognize that clothes have been a huge health support for women because uh, studies uh, the, there is a, a, a huge a deluge of studies to show that women are um, groomed into body surveillance uh, and uh, self objectification because of our fashion imagery and our media imagery um, because of repeatedly having to look at themselves via the lens of of male gaze or dominant culture gaze shall we say because many women are acculturated into thinking about femininity from a perspective of a sort of phallocentric or patriarchal uh, ideal. And I don't include, I absolutely don't include uh, all men in this space. It's a very small, limited group of men who have the power to uh, recast the world in their own vi vision, to make uh, in their own image, to make decisions that serve only them and their small circle. And there are many masculinities who are also 
uh, made into outsiders as um, women and non-binary and trans identities are. But we've got to allow for the fact that young women particularly see garments as tools for self-expression and self-esteem. So there is that possibility and opportunity for some small experience of power because uh, as, as our study shows there women uh, en masse have lower self-esteem than men do next slide please and so we come to the, the stories that we tell ourselves and uh, so fast fashion delivers the simplicity the efficacy convenience affordability and accessibility and again this is coming back to Alex uh, Asun's um, blog when he was writing about it um, and so this uh, on a psychological level, so sorry, uh, decline that. Uh, on a psychological level, um, this instant gratification, the rewarding quick fixes that the brain seeks, delivers a dopamine surge, and we develop a craving associated with dopamine release. So we've got to be able to understand and unpick this when we are marketing to uh, these potential 18 to 24 year olds, the, the highest group of mass consumers. And now currently um, just, just in from McKinsey, consumers say, and they're now saying that two thirds of them are worried about inflation. Obviously we all understand why that's there. Um, novelty. Uh, so, so many styles to, to choose from, so much change, so much color and excitement, so much different messaging. The brain loves novelty and emotional arousal because it delivers the hedonic and the eudynamic uh, uh, experience or to, that we understand for well-being. So in the first instance, the pleasure, but in the second, the meaning and purpose that we are all seeking. And uh, this experience of tracking down opportunities for novelty and emotional arousal can often be as a response to trying to alleviate boredom. But a key sort of feedback loop here is when we begin to rely on this and engage in addictive behavior, we can also create distractions, making it difficult for us to focus on the actions that create long-term success. So the commitment needed to adopt a lifestyle that perhaps uh, is stripping away some of those instant fixes, those easy pleasures. Um, we often tell ourselves comforting falsehoods, and this is preferable to cognitive dissonance. The comforting falsehoods currently for a lot of consumers um, is that uh, purchasing fast fashion is not a bad thing. It stimulates the economy, it promotes jobs, and a lot of us believe that it's an important de democratization tool, that cheap fashion means everyone has access to the latest trends. Um, and obviously, that's the global north thinking about their experience uh, it, to engage with fashion. Next slide, please. We'll talk a little bit more about um, cognitive dis dissonance. So uh, cognitive dissonance arrives when um, there's an exper a discomfort experience when a consumer's purchasing decisions contradict their morals and beliefs. So I believe that we have to do something dramatic to turn around uh, what's happening. But, oh, look at that. That's just come in. I'd love that. That, um, you know, that's I, it, it, I can justify this to myself. I mean, after all, it's not legal. Um, and so what we're learning is that sustainability is still a secondary concern when buying new fashion for many, many purchasers. And yet nearly half of consumers, 48 percent, again in the US, say they would change their consumption habits to reduce their impact on the environment if. But what is that if? Um, that's something for us to um, uh, uh, work through and discover. So one of the reasons that perhaps we're in this position is the lack of awareness and unseen problems in, in fashion, or it could be a Faustian pact where um, we sort of agree to do something knowing that it's not the right thing to do. And so one of the key things that I'm looking at as possibly room for perhaps business declares uh, and alignment with um, What's happening prior to the businesses, the small businesses, is all the other um, creatives who are being trained up 
in our fashion, fashion education system, which is simply a capitalist vehicle, uh, long gone are the days where these small, cute art schools reflected on culture and movements and, uh, um, and, and narratives. Now it's mass producing young creatives to work within the systems that we don't want to see more of, but they are funded to a certain extent by those systems. And what we know is that um, uh, fashion education is still offering sustainability as a module of choice, as not a case of every single action in pursuit of learning about fashion is underpinned by its sustainable knowledge. And of course, the big stores, Zara being one of the biggest fast fashion giants, uh, is there with sponsorship money, is there with jobs at the end of it. So somehow we have got to also address this change. Um, yes, so for us to think about, uh, we want to create new drives, motivations and perceptions for the next generation of consumers uh, and for consumers now, 50 percent of whom say they would be willing to buy sustainable clothing. They would be willing to engage in that lifestyle. But we've got to understand um, what we're working with here. So the individual experience, the single um Citizen participant, not mindless consumer, can be proactive through choice and uh, obviously reduced consumption. Uh, but for us to know that uh, this is messaging, we can help spread that it is positively associated with subjective well-being because we feel we have gained mastery over something we, that concerns us and we're doing something about it. We, uh, we can be maximizing that much more in our messaging. Nostalgia, again, just in becoming much more of a key trend, um, consumers are leaning, young consumers are leaning towards uh, reminders of the past when it was simpler when we weren't thinking about climate emergency when there wasn't all this overwhelming information so again channeling nostalgia as delivering some a dopamine hit instead of the the fast uh, quick fix gratification and novelty and the cultural messing messaging opportunities we are, have been given just simply by climate uh, decimation at the moment the 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 red hot heat wave the instant gratification the novelty pursuit and addiction is not cool and obviously the you know the the meanings they're not lost on us because we we're all overheated right now so uh, in, in my mind, activism must target um, not just the individual consumers to be making these choices, not just the businesses, but also turn its view to the fashion educational institutions, which currently seem to sit outside of these conversations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, really deep and um, I think many of us will be wanting to, to re-watch your presentation later um, to to, to think about it further, some profound thoughts and um, analysis there. Um, we're, we're going to, uh, we have a recording from Fanny, the, the co-founder of Vestiaire Collective, and um, many of you know that um, we, we, as we move from the growth logic to earth logic, um, Kate Fletcher Matilda Tan's wonderful book, Earth Logic, talked about reducing the production and consumption of fashion by between 75 to 95 percent and at Fashion Declares we've been looking at how we redesign the fashion industry to fit within planetary boundaries um, and I think Vestiaire Collective are a really great example of one business that is, has designed their business model around reducing um, the need for uh, new fashion so if I could ask Millie to uh, to uh, show us Fanny's uh, lovely presentation thank you. Hi guys, uh, hello Fashion Declares, I'm Fanny Moisan, I'm the co-founder of Vestiaire Collective and I'm very happy to be uh, today with you, even though it's just a, a small recording, um, but I wanted to um, be present uh, uh, because I really truly admire um, the Fashion Declares movement um, and all these talented industry people coming together 
um, to fight uh, for the climate and the environment and the people um, on our planet. So Vestiaire Collective, for the ones who um, don't know uh, about the company, it's uh, uh, an online marketplace dedicated to um, secondhand luxury fashion. And the inception of Vestiaire was really um, looking at our industry um, and understanding that it has dramatically changed under uh, the influence of mainly fast fashion. And that fast fashion impact had led to a consumer that is still is, unfortunately, and, and was 13 years ago, completely drugged uh, by novelty. So a consumer that was willing to consume more and more and more to have the latest trend, the la latest outfit, to show himself or herself uh, with a new um, outfit on, on social media. So that created that massive problems um, that we um, spotted back then was we call it we used to call it waste um, in people's wardrobe and and that lack of of consciousness in um, in the way we address fashion as as consumer consumers so that was the the, the starting point of vestia um, and that's why we've built that uh, online marketplace with that again enables people to buy and sell uh, what they uh, own or no longer wear in a very different way, uh, meaning in a trusted environment, uh, but also in a very inspiring way because we are um, fashion lovers that treasure the craftsmanship and the, and the creativity in our industry. And we really wanted to uh, support fashion in that respect and not just be uh, criticizing and uh, looking down on it. So. That was the inception of, of Vestia. And obviously, I'm not going to tell you how uh, polluting is our industry and um, that our problem has worsened and worsened um, across the years. Indeed, on the on the graph you see on the bottom left from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, it's a very popular one. You see how much the sales of um, fashion and clothing has increased uh, over the, the, the years. Um, and at the same time, the utilization of clothing has completely uh, dropped. So that led to product in, in still good quality uh, being underused and having a, a shorter um, lifespan. So at Vestiaire, we really want to um, focus on that uh, usage um, part of uh, the life of items and, and make it more sustainable. So, what consumers can do? So, Vestiaire is a part uh, of the solution, as in it offers um, a way to uh, consume, consume better. Um, and indeed, 85% uh, of buyers are trading up um, thanks to Vestiaire Collective and to resell in general, meaning if you have um, the purchasing power to buy, I don't know, a fast fashion item firsthand, uh, maybe you cannot afford uh, a little bit uh, more expensive brand, but also more qualitative brand firsthand, definitely. So if you trade up um, using resell as a leverage uh, for your purchasing power, you'll be able to consume better. And so our whole um, strategy is to be first um, an exemplary company um, from the inside. Uh, so we don't want to be... Uh, finger pointing or, or to tell the others what to do uh, before we do our own uh, work. Um, and that's why we've been working uh, very hard in the past months and, and years to first achieve our uh, B Corp status uh, that we were very proud to um, have and to be rewarded by uh, last summer. So it's been a year of uh, becoming the first uh, unicorn um, B Corp uh, out there. Uh, we've also launched a more recently our first impact report uh, that shows uh, a lot of great progress um, in our in our field on the environment environmental side, but also economic and social side. So we are trying to again move the needle internally um, to be better at everything we do um, from carbon to um, our community of suppliers, but also obviously our teams. And that's the internal part of our strategy, but we are also trying to move the needle again for, for our community. So we are 
building campaigns, for example, but also features and incentives on, on Vestiaire for people to shop um, better, as in more local, uh, avoid uh, lots of uh, transport and also favor brands that are um, more sustainable. And we've built some, um, some little tools and even a, a fashion activist badge uh, to reward people that are uh, fully circular at their own level, meaning they are buying and selling um, secondhand. Finally, outside of Vestiaire, we are working with um, NGOs and foundations uh, such as Ellen MacArthur, but also working hard with uh, the World Economic Forum um, and the SMI um, of Prince Charles um, to um, help uh, the industry um, get better at, at everything we do and innovate on the NFT and, and blockchain side, uh, for example. Uh, to one day be able to trace uh, one product from its um, creation to its end of life. Um, and finally, we are working also with um, uh, luxury brands or, or e-tailers uh, to enable them uh, to approach um, secondhand uh, through a brand partnership program. Um, and I'm thinking here uh, of my Teresa, uh, Alexander McQueen, um, and also more recently, uh, Luisa Viaroma. So uh, that was a very, very, very high level and short presentation. Um, I'm very happy uh, to be with you. And um, I hope next time I will uh, be physically uh, in person uh, with you guys um, to help um, all of us uh, save our planet. Bye. Well, we're delighted to have had um, a, a recording by Fanny, even even though she she couldn't join us in person. But uh, but hopefully you you enjoyed the message um, of the Vestiaire Collective and and can see how how secondhand can help to to reduce um, the 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 buying of new and and to spread awareness um, a, a, amongst the community. Um, something like 5 million items online, 25,000 put up every day, you know, even though it's, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a small part of those 100, 150 billion garments that are produced per year, you know, the, there are many exciting initiatives like this that, that are really capturing the imagination. And I think uh, Vestia Collective is a brilliant example of that. So thank you. Um, I'd like to move to um, to Lucy Shea to invite you to um, to to tell us a little bit about um, how you've been um, really steering uh, as a as a creative change agency um, your work in in fashion communications. Um, I mean, clearly, you know, very exciting agency. I, I'd love you to to tell us what you've been doing in working with larger fashion brands. Um, and uh, you know the kinds of problems that perhaps you might you might find yourself facing. Um, perhaps you know may, maybe needing to step in and, and and be a bit more radical with the brief. Um, but love over to you, Lucy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Safia. <clears throat> I'm also delighted to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, really great to hear the presentations before, and I'd love to pick up on a couple of the points and then extend, as you say, Safia, to kind of give more of a um, agency and from working with some of the big corporates, big corporate perspective. Um, but just a few words on Futera and kind of what our story is and where we've come from. And and then I, I, would, I would love to go on to um, what we've learned about fashion comms how it's changing with the climate, ecological and social emergency um, and give some practical advice as well as uh, how to how we have challenged that brief. Um, so uh, Futera, I think, has an unusual position in the agency world in that we are fortunate to hold the confidence of both the corporates. We have, you know, amazing brands um, on our books. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about our work with them in a moment. But we also work very much in the activist and change and youth movement. So um, we started, uh, well, actually in 2003, we did the UK government's first climate change attitude change strategy. And for that reviewed, I mean, every single bit out there on how you change hearts and minds around climate change. I was really enjoying um, your presentation, Carolyn. It's taken me back to cognitive dissonance and discounting and all these things. 
Um, and I should say as well, we're, we're B Corp. Um, we were one of the UK's founding B Corps and we're majority female owned and run. So Devora really uh, felt very strongly about um, your presentation as well. Um, so there we were in 2003, our big break was doing the UK's first national climate change communication strategy. But quite swiftly, we started to work much more closely on fashion. And for all of the reasons that have been flagged before, um, and for something which is a little bit trite to say now, but it, it wasn't then, which is that, you know, as um, Fanny highlighted, we work in a crappy industry, but, uh, uh, but it has such power and potential and influence over uh, us as consumers and the publics, um, architects of desire, makers of manners. So we very rapidly, we, well, well, we started the swishing campaign um, in 2007, and that was, uh, you know, sharing economy, clothes swapping parties, back when it wasn't talked about so much. And, and really what we found worked in that, and you know, swishing is a bit defunct now. Others far more successful have taken it on, such as Vestiaire Collective. But why swishing and clothes swapping parties exploded was it because it leaned into that emotional piece, um, because it, it, it lent into some of our drivers around status and novelty, but removed the unfortunate side effects. So kind of there I'd say point one in terms of what's driven Futera across the years, what motivated us and also what we found has worked even with our larger corporate um, pieces is to you know start from where people are and make it fun if you want it done um there's there's a lot of fear out there which is a necessary component um but lean into behave lean into psychology and lean into the emotional making it fun if you want it done um 2008, we put on with Cindy Rhodes and Tamsin Lejeune the first uh, ethical fashion awards in the UK. Uh, it was fantastic, and then we hit the uh, you know the recession, the great financial crash just after that. So it was a very um, kind of emotional time for us at Futera. We just put these uh, awards on, and then had to shut down our US business for a while to kind of tackle, to focus on our UK business as as the great as as the um, recession hit. Um, but that piece around working with the activists and the change has continued. You know, I was one of the first uh, uh, kind of pro bono comms director of Fashion Revolution and sit as a trustee still. Um, so now uh, we have this new mission at Futera and it's called Make the Anthropocene Awesome. So Anthropocene, uh, meaning the recent May age of man or woman. Um, uh, uh, awesome, meaning if we're going to actually fix this crisis that we're in, we've got to aim for better, not just good enough. We've got to paint a picture of where we're going, which is strong enough to get us to do the hard work to get there, because it ain't going to be easy. Um, and I feel it's particularly current at the moment because, again, as Carolyn kind of pointed to, the number one worry at the moment is inflation. People ask the calls you probably all had from your friends and family if you're UK based or European based about the heat wave, um, that, that, that fear that it's too late is very current out there and it's not. We, the signs are there, we can build a better world and solve some of these challenges um, around equality and diversity by solving climate change along the way. I mean, I firmly believe that and it's guided our work along the way. Okay, so just briefly, if we go to the client, to the client work, um, so as I say, we sit in this kind of um, interchange, if you like, between the activist and change movement and the corporates, and where we um, launched Tommy Hilfiger's Make It Possible campaign, which is about welcoming all and wasting nothing. So leaning into both the climate and ecological emergency, but also the social one. And if we just go to the next slide, you can see some of the kind of the visuals that came out of this. What, just a moment on what, what we did here and how we, us and our amazing team there, Esther Verberg and the CSO, kind of pushed each other to get the most um, uh, stretch and ambitious work out there that, that we could. Um, first of all, we made sure that the sustainability platform was really integrated with the business and brand. So that mission, uh, Welcome All and Waste Nothing, actually... Um, uh, started to drive the business strategy 
Um, you'll see on some following slides some of the outcome of this, such as the Tommy for Life, their resale and re-commerce platform, but critically was also integrated into the brand. And it, without, uh, you know, not breaking client confidentiality, what this strategy was also designed to do was position Tommy Hilfiger as very much a modern and relevant brand, which was, which was um, where it was shooting for as a business. And actually what they realized was that sustainability could give the proof points and the reasons to believe for it to be seen as a much more modern, diverse, less kind of waspy um, American brand. So it absolutely gave business benefit and loyalty and reputation and all the rest of it. But sitting behind this comms campaign were, you know, 25 really stretched targets around you know recycled polyester but also DEI um, and picking up on issues which again now are completely common parlance but things such as microplastics um, which weren't um, so much in corporate strategies at the moment and as you're putting together your, your strategy and comms do your level best to do a scan out there of all the trends that are coming your way because the thing about sustainability is it changes in a heartbeat and something which is not an issue today is, is suddenly is is on top of boardroom agenda um you know and and quite often you see a bit of a disconnect between the sustainability strategy and actually what is really uppermost on consumer minds you know if your sustainability communications and strategy don't help you when black lives matter hits or um when fourth wave feminism hits or you can see one coming now with indigenous, you know, if you're not actually tracking these forecast issues and figuring out when they're going to hit your business, your sustainability strategy and comms will become um, well out of date quite quickly. So I'll just close with one piece, if I may. So which is the, the thing that gives me hope at the moment is this huge focus on behavior change that we've Safi introduced with the um, 1.5 degree lifestyle piece from UN um, Fashion Charter. The latest IPCC report uh, for the first time validates the focus on behavior change and individual change. Um, it even identifies top 60 actions that can mitigate. And I think we're going to see both regulation coming down the line on that, but also an opportunity for progressive and purposeful brands to really lean into helping their consumer be the hero, uh, take control of their lifestyle, feel amazing about it because it tracks across to well-being. Uh, we see that and um, we've seen that from Carolyn and in the IPCC for the first time as well. And just know that all those big corporates and governments are listening to us and to you and tracking our lifestyle changes in order to create more change. Over to you. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, I, um, I, I'm wondering if there are any questions um, in the chat box that the speakers have uh, um, recognized and want to, uh, to answer. Um, I see that Pujar in India has, has uh, directed one at Karen. Um, I don't know, Karen, whether you'd like to um, quickly answer uh, speak to that. Karen, it was an extremely in insightful presentation. Um, cognitive psychology justifying consumerism is a very profound narrative. Brands are literally hiring psychologists uh, for trend forecast. Uh, I mean, the, the, you know, brands and advertising agencies have always hired psychologists specifically to manipulate the consumer. So there's a very sort of different space here where we are looking to uh, help the consumer gain mastery over something that makes them fearful, makes them feel powerless. And specifically, you know, there's, there's lots of work to be done in trying to understand how we help, for the most part, young women who are prolific consumers of fashion as armor to help with the low self-esteem that this culture presents, which is you will be looked at, you will be evaluated, you will be talked at, and these qualities about you you will be um, valued over and above who you are and what you can do and what you stand for. And so clothes have been massive for young women to uh, use as comfort blankets or armor and helping them in our languaging and our invitation to know that it doesn't have to be just in the, the repeat um, 
uh, buying, the repeat purchasing, the, the addictive seeking of this feeling, um, this fix to feel better, but it has to be in something else. And, and sustainability's message, which is uh, a, a very, very good one, you know, pay more, buy well, make it last longer, love clothes last, may not be speaking to this huge group of new consumers. And we've got to work out how to speak to them and invite them in. And, and to the point earlier that um, I, th I think both um, Deborah and, and, and you spoke to, um, the, the, the narrative is becoming more sophisticated by, by the day. Um, we were at Northern Fashion Week and some of the audience said, you know, well, well how about the discussion about racism within supply chains, um, which is, of course, the case. Um, you know, how are we really going to be able to, to justif justify um, diversity and inclusion in, in our first world workplaces when we're not demanding um, the, a, a living income and, uh, and basic human rights within, within the supply chains, um, which, which are mostly uh, powered by black and brown women. Delighted to have you all on this call. I'd, I'd very much encourage you to, uh, to, to sign up to the Fashion Declares um, community and network so that you'll get uh, invitations to join webinars and um, uh, and uh, and different meetings like this. Um, I, I'd really appreciate if if each of our speakers could just give us a a one minute message when it comes to creating the new fashion narrative. Um, you know, from your perspective, you know, what do you think is is the 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 biggest driver to overcome the obstacle? And 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 Lucy, I know. Um, the, the element around fun, but I, I'd like to hear even more deeply, perhaps. But if I could start with you, Deborah, what do you what do you think? How do we need to develop this new narrative to truly overcome uh, the the kinds of um, dominant culture and uh, and and really move beyond this kind of legacy of of what we've been so used to during these these last twenty years? Well, something you just uh, mentioned there um, um, about the supply chain, you know, going forward for creating new ways of, of being and thinking, you know, it's all based on colonialism and we have to bring everybody along on, a, on a, an equal basis. And I think that the, 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 um, the way forward, you know, has to be uh, one of equality for all people, really. Whatever we manage to do that. Yeah. Uh, and we have the, the EU human rights due diligence, which which will enforce companies to be transparent. Um, uh, and if we have a modern slavery act, um, the uh, the the um, the update coming through in, in September, October, we might actually have you know laws with claws. I mean, we, we we desperately need to enforce yes. um, the um, the leg what, what could be effective legislation. Um, Karen, can I ask you to um, to tell us what where you feel um, we really need to put our energies? Well, I'm a gut instinct person, um, really, and so my feeling is being able to talk about the importance of sustainability for our mental health, because as we move forward into what are quite frightening um, sort of uh, uh, visions. Um, which are on our doorstep now, uh, our young must be feeling really, really powerless and concerned um, and know that, you know, when we when we look at our politicians, um, there are something like 2% of politicians under 30 who are really properly thinking about the future and the needs of our young. So our young are not represented and being able to empower our young to be authentic and to be concerned about their mental health and the impact that lack of sustainability um, conversations and actions have, I think would be would be uh, something that they could feel that it was completely right to tune into their gut and tip the table over and you know if if we really talk about real governance the governance governance for um a, a 1.5 degree lifestyle um it is about having young people there on the board and not in a tokenistic way um but you know truly having that urgency there um you know at board 
at board level and in well, we've, we've, we've got to recognise, actually, that, you know, experience isn't the only value metric for leadership and that so many of our leaders are embroiled in sorting out their last comfortable 10, 15 years on the planet. Totally. And totally. they're not interested in what happens beyond that. And we we have a, a global leadership full of incompetent sort of macho swaggering leaders concerned with their own self-regard. And they're not collaborative. They're not thinking about the future. And um, Nicole said, you know, thank you for recognizing the ageism that we have in our dominant culture is that young people's views don't matter, which, of course, that's not what we're saying here. Quite. Lucy, from a passing yes. comment from you, please. Um, I would say there's two, I, I mean, I ha wholeheartedly agree with all of that. And actually to just build on that, I think it's quite distasteful. Certainly in kind of the comms industry, it is uh, the establishment still running it. And, mm. and a very, very kind of kicking and screaming recent recognition on um, uh, the idea that comms needs to take uh, responsibility for its emissions of influence rather than just its footprint. So advertising agencies have been, you know, work, working very hard to kind of note their carbon footprint while quite, you know, radically ignoring the impact of their, what they do for their clients, which obviously where is where the true impact lies. Um, so radical, uh, you know, we need more honesty and we need more transparency. I know it's a something that's been thumped for a while but we really do and can I will just really quick word on solutions this 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 um fatalism that we see amongst the young um the belief that it's too late uh, so that goes across all ages but particularly and unsurprisingly on the young is in my view a bigger issue than even climate change <laughs> because we can solve climate change it's a it's a question of mitigation adaptation but you know solving that feeling of um the lack of agency fatalism it's too late is i think the biggest problem on our hands thank you and i wonder if millie as a parting slide we could just bring up those uh, those two books you know they're really exciting um you know project drawdown there's lots of information there on the the fashion declares website on on real sustainability um on the project drawdown um but but certainly you know that 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 action you know really is is one of the um one of the most powerful ways that we can keep our our, our mental health um in in the best possible place um i really want to thank um our fabulous speakers and all of you for staying with us this evening um joining this this uh, seminar this this webinar will these have been deep and very meaningful conversations this evening and uh yeah, I've, I've, I've learned a great deal and I, and I thank you all um, speakers and audience for all of your participation. So thank you and calling you really to, to be, you know, these, these very brave and radical leaders um, that we need today. Thank you so much from Fashion Declares and, and uh, uh, looking forward to seeing you on, on future webinars. Thank you. Thank you, Safia. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Safia. Thank, thank you, everyone. You, everyone. Thank you, Safia. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care.